warm welcome, somewhat belated, uh, this evening on behalf of the Raza Foundation. We have instituted seven memorial lectures after seven great masters of our time. Kumar Gandhar, Adil Tandir, Agge, Daya Krishna, B.S. Kai Tonde, Hilton Mahapath, and Manikov. And this is the second lecture. These lectures are also an attempt to create an intellectual mass around these arts uh, which they present. So there is no um, expectation that the person should speak about the, uh, the person on whom the lecture is named. But we leave it to the speaker to it should remain within the uh, within the area of concerns that that person represents. In case of Manikal, it's not only cinema, it's also visual arts, it's also music, in which he was very deeply interested. But primarily, cinema. Now, Rashmi Dorai Swami, let me see her so many things. So, and most people know you anyway, so I don't have to read out your biodata. But she, as you know, has studied Russian language and literature at JNU. There was a time when the word JNU meant a lot, no? Have times changed? I don't know. Not yet. Anyway. Not yet. And uh, her doctoral thesis is on Mikhail Bakhtin. And she has received the National Award for the Best Film Critic in 1994 and has been awarded the Majlis Research Fellowship in 1919 <coughs> for a project entitled Changing Narrative Strategies of Hindi Cinema. Her entry on film and literature has appeared in the Encyclopedia of Postcolonial Literatures in English. Her entries on Indian and foreign cinemas have appeared in the Little Black Book movies. She is the author of the post-Soviet condition, Chinge's Almato, Al 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 in the 90s, Gurudat Through Light and Shade. She is the editor of Cultural History of Central Asia. Some energy, energy business also. <laughs> I am giving her some time to settle down. She is feeling very exasperated, obviously. She is co-editor co of Being in Big Ming, the Cinemas of Asia, <coughs> Globalization of Third World, and Asian Film Journey Selections from Cinema. And Dr. Rashmi Swami will speak on Money Call and the New Image. So the <laughs> permission, I'll sit down there so that I can hear you better. I'm really, really sorry for being so late. I've been on the road since 4.30. I live in Gurgaon on Sona Road. And uh, well, today the traffic was something unbelievable. Uh, and it was just impossible for me to get here. I'm really very sorry. And thank you all for waiting for so long. I almost thought that uh, I probably would have come so late. Um, I, Thank you, Ashokji, for that uh, very nice introduction, which uh, calmed me down. <laughs> um, I consider it a great honor and privilege to be invited to the Raza Foundation and Ashokji to deliver this memorial lecture on one of the most important filmmakers and thinkers on art and aesthetics in India in the 20th and 21st centuries. One of the three films that heralded the Indian New Wave in 1969. Basu Chatterjee's Sara Akash, Mrinal Sen's Bhuvan Shom, and Mani Calls Uski Roti, it was Uski Roti that was the film of rupture, the film that did not look like anything seen before, a film that could not be quickly yoked to a known tradition. The very first sequence of the film made a devil-may-care statement of things to come and announced the intent of the young filmmaker to puncture conventional techniques of storytelling. A stone is repeatedly thrown at a fruit tree. A girl appears in the distance and again throws a stone. The guava falls. It lies there till a male hand picks it up. 
We see a male back and a little bit of the girl's head. The stare and the look they give each other is not seen but is very palpable. The man slowly offers the fruit. The girl hesitatingly takes it, showing her irritation at the fact that she had felt the fruit but it had been picked up by the man. There is a slight lag in the cause and effect chain of action throughout the sequence, heralding the director's lifelong commitment to issues of temporality in cinema. If there ever was a signature of authorial intent in a debut film, this was it, and Call remained steadfast to this vision, whatever the hurdles and criticism he faced throughout his life. Money Calls Over, in the films he made in India, consists in the main of adaptations of literary works. In addition to features, he made documentaries on music, on a writer, Mukti Bodh, as well as on folk and artisanal art forms. He made shorter documentaries on the arrival of migrant labor into Bombay, on Kashmir and on Rajasthan. He was also a painter and trained in Thrupad music. His relationship to music was so deep that he said the phrase background music used for scores in films pained him deeply. Music informed his works in many ways, not the least in the rhythm and pacing of the shots as well as the structuration of narrative. He was a director who was deeply respected, who deeply respected the textuality of the written work since he engaged so often with adaptations which included stories, poetry, novels and a play. A lot of his work thus focused on thinking about other art forms through cinema. He was also a director who spoke of the marginalized and the dispossessed, particularly women, of the traumatic shift from the rural and the feudal to the urban, of the migration of people and art forms, of difficult middle class and lower middle class lives that were nonetheless lived with dignity and the hope of utopian release. He found it difficult to get funding after the first three features he made, Uski Roti, Ashar Din 1971 and Duvidha 1973. And he was forced to make short and long documentaries for nearly a decade, from 79 to 89, from Ghasiram Kotwal to Nazar. In this too, he broke all canons and created an impressive body of work that was poetic and philosophical, allowing the form of the documentary to be thought of in new ways. Towards the end of the 90s, he began to live and teach abroad, returning to India a few years before he passed away. A wonderful conversationalist, teacher and narrator with a textured grain of voice that he used to good effect in many of his films, he often joked that when people met him, they would frankly ask him why such a lively storyteller with a great sense of humor made such boring and slow films. Where do we place the work of Manikal in the firmament of cultural practices in India? In the history of world cinema, there are directors who view cinema as an art form alongside other older forms such as painting, music, architecture, literature. Cinema is viewed in its specificity as a discipline with a focus on its form and the elements that constitute this form. Manikal was one such filmmaker. It is not easy to define the place that Manikol's body of work occupies in Indian cinema. If the body of works we classify as the Indian New Wave is arranged as a spectrum that stretches from the realist to the modernist to the experimental, then Call's work would definitely occupy the experimental fringe. Yet this positioning is problematic for the experimental would partake of modernism. But Call considered himself in many ways a classicist. Just as the public broadcasting has a slot for Shastriya Sangeet, it should also have a slot for Shastriya cinema, he quipped in one of his earlier interviews to Iqbal Masood, who spoke to him after Uski Roti was shown on television. Classicist but not canonical, experimental but not wholly and only modernist, avant-garde but in the vanguard of a movement whose trajectories diverged into many parts unrelated to him. Intensely engaged with literature, music and painting, yet creator of a body of work that remained consistently cinematic. An engaging rancor and flamboyant cult figure, but minimalistic and fanatically anti-plot in his filmic practice. Extremely innovative in form, but with a deep engagement to, social, to the social, mythical and historical. He made films for the state-established NFTC, Doordarshan, Madhya Pradesh Kala Parishad and Films Division but did not compromise on his style or partake of developmental aesthetics or nation-building rhetoric. 
His work does not easily fit into any of the dominant theoretical discourses of the human sciences, which is not to say that his work does not intersect at some point with them. His films cannot be labeled post-colonialist or modernist, political or radical, or aligned with theories of subalternity without qualifying them further. His work has to do with the problematic of home and homelessness, but not in the sense of the diaspora and its imaginings, which post-colonial theory seems to weigh down in favor of. His lifelong abhorrence of perspective, likewise, can be seen as an indirect critique of colonialism, for it was during the time of the expansion into colonies that the fixing of the location of the viewer in relation to a given space uh, became a dominant mode of representation. In fact, it is this taking up of issue with perspective that aligns him with modernism, but here too he finds, he finds his own tarha, his own way within the canons of modernism. I quote, fight against perspective has inspired many a modern painter, writer, filmmaker from the turn of the 20th century. The effort in cinema has been naturally limited since the birth of the pinhole camera came about through perspective itself, he says. This was the central paradox that he worked with, the creation of abstraction in the diegetic world of particularity that cinema offered and the attempt to break unavoidable perspective in cinema through various means and devices. Not for him the fragmentation of space to break with perspective, not for him multiple perspectives to view an object. For him the break with perspective came through a hybrid conjunction of Western and Indian aesthetic traditions of thinking about subjectivity and its interactions with the world. In the Indian tradition, he has acknowledged the influence of Dvanya Lok, the 9th century treatise on aesthetics, Sangeet Sameh Sa, the 13th century treatise on music, and the classical school of singing of Drupad in which he trained rigorously. In the Western tradition, Kohl has repeatedly referred to his closeness to the works of Dostoevsky, Bresson, Matisse, and Tarkovsky. The use of techniques that can be called alienation effects in the Brechtian sense also link him to the modernist impulse. Yet, rather than the exotic, the, uh, the archaic pre-modern or the romantic that fascinated many modernists, Kohl drew on classical Indian texts. Miniature paintings are one of the most studied in detail by Kohl for breaking with perspective and for offering parts of rendering the image and the traveling gaze they facilitated. Convergence and climax, the two devices of narratives, were also to be discarded. What was to be valorized instead was the improvisation that Indian classical music allowed. In this lecture, I will focus on the relationship to the works of his teacher, Ritwik Ghatak, to Dostoevsky and Tarkovsky, as well as examine some of the concepts from the Western and Indian traditions that he drew upon throughout his career. The critique of convergence in perspective led call to traditions of Western philosophy that questioned the positing of the unified unitary subject with the metaphysics of presence in the 20th century. The crisis of the subject as conscious being, confidently saying, I think, therefore I am, was dealt with with many thinkers in the 20th century since it was clear that there were large fields of unconscious thinking through and disrupting the conscious self. Characteristically, it is not the dominant French Lacanian tradition of psychoanalysis that he draws upon, but the British tradition of the Mathura Bowen analyst Wilfred Bion. Bion, who followed Melanie Klein and developed his own theories, did group therapy as well as individual therapy. Rather than focus on the Oedipal and castration complex theories, he focused on the relationship between the waking, dreaming and sleeping states and the mapping of mental space as an empirical given, which he believed was multidimensional and immense. Loss and trauma for the child began from the womb, where drawing on Klein and her theory of the first objects that the child knows sensuously, he went on to chart the transference from the liquid state in amniotic fluid to the gaseous state that the child had to adapt to post-birth and the residues of the liquid state in the saliva, nasal catara and other bodily fluids that persisted in, as lifelong traces of that initial amniotic state. This notion of physical space and its trace was important for Call in the creation of tenses of time in cinema. In Towards the Cinematic Object, he delineates how the past and future can be imaged, drawing on Wilfred Bion. I quote, attention preoccupies differently. The past is characterized when the spatial rhythm is composed of a store of sensual objects and the future a conjunction of sensually satisfying objects. The other model Bion proposed was the physical intercourse one of the container and the contained. 
Money Cole drew on this theory, divested it of its psychoanalytic, paranoid, schizoid and depressive motivations and welded it to Indian aesthetic theories of subjectivity, conscience, the nature of the object and the image. What fascinated Cole more than the Freudian theory of the child playing and interjecting fort da to come to terms with the trauma of the absence of the mother was the absence that foresees the possibility of a presence. The example he adduces from beyond of the is of the lips and the mouth of the baby in the womb that takes the shape of the mother's breast that is currently an absence, but anticipates as a future presence. The future unity with the breast will be subsequently splintered and will later be totally absent. These three states correspond to waking, dreaming, sleeping states. In this theory, the states of sleeping, dreaming, waking are not seen so much as a play of condensation and displacement of conscious and unconscious desires, but as a spectrum in which each, each state is within the other and extends not just to human subjectivity, but to the organic and inorganic world at large. The waking self was the one that had to do with perspective and realism. It was the other two selves, according to Cole, that could break with perspective. The waking state is sandwiched between the object that seeks its container and the object that will be splintered. The dreaming state negotiates between the splintered object and its total absence. The sleeping state is the suspension between the total absence of the object and its return to the state of seeking the container, which is the state designated as prior absence. This spiral of waking, dreaming, sleeping states of presencing and absencing as a perpetual movement that was central to Cole's thinking throughout his career. In the Indian aesthetic the theories, the qualities of the object, mutability, change, its subtle reality, attributes, class, markers of identification, physical location, the emotions it gives rise to, or its relation with human life were clearly defined. <coughs> It is further classified according to whether the object is perceptible or non-perceptible, present or non-present, amenable to the intellect or to the senses, and whether it is a real or a remembered object. In Seen from Nowhere, Cole writes, out of the six ways of perceiving objects in space, as developed by various philosophical schools in India, the first five deal with the perception of the object, but the sixth called Anuplabdhi, the non-available, deals with the perception of the absent object, that is, with the perception of an object because it is absent. The notion of non-availability in the world Anuplabdhi is precise because it not only makes the absence necessary, but also its perception possible. This absence was an important structuring part of Indian music as well. I quote from Call again, I shall continue to maintain that the original word for the excluded notes, vivadi, meaning argumentative, is more appropriate than the later varjit, meaning prohibited. Vivadi is best described as an absence which is arguing with the invariant presences, with invariance itself. But it is an argument never brought out into the open to become a conflicting feature of the musical object. It is now clear why Cole espoused the point void binary as against the object horizon couple. The first pair always plays with presence and absence. The second is always within the realm of the given and the perceptible and seeks convergence to boot. In his lengthy article seen from nowhere, he states that whereas the object horizon split offers space as present or makes available a presence outside being, the point void split apprehends space as an absence, perceives it through its non-availability to being. This dynamics of absence structuring a presence, but remaining outside its ambit, fascinated Cole also because he was deeply influenced by Anand Vardhan's Dhvanya Lok with its theory of the various kinds of resonance or Dhvani that could be achieved through suggestion in verbal constructions of the image. Suggestion could arise when the denoted meaning was unintended or set aside, shifted to something else. The level of revelation or dhvani could only be reached when the suggestion leads forth to rasa. In Mani's films and writings, while the emphasis is on resonance, there seems to be little engagement with the nine canonized rasas, particularly in their essentialist or spectacular form. How then is the state of resonance 
achieved for money if it is divorced from rasa i would suggest that the films of call propose a 10th rasa over and above the nine codified ones of the erotic comic heroic tragic furious fearsome gruesome wondrous and peaceful which could be called the rasa of intellection or thoughtfulness this could even be a subset of the ninth rasa of peacefulness there are very few directors who give so much prominence to characters thinking about their condition this self reflexivity runs through his entire oeuvre and holds within it the break with the action image images of attentiveness and non attentiveness or emptiness and thoughtfulness abound in his films in duvidha based on vijay dan deta's folk tale for instance the indecision of being in two minds is not restricted to the daughter in law of the house who had willingly cohabited with a ghost when her husband was away but engulfs the father of the husband the ghost as well as the shepherd who after solving the puzzle the of the who the real husband is is shown to be lost in thought perhaps also riven with doubt as to whether he did the right thing in siddheshwari the young siddhi learns her singing almost entirely through listening to her not very musically inclined cousin being taught music by the sarangi player among the ways of knowing the object as outlined in indian philosophical and aesthetic texts call privileged attention over others such as meditation and devotion is it is this rasa of intellection that is evident in his use of music as well that comes in as a dialogic moment in the narrative sometimes argumentative sometimes almost as a speaking voice the distinctive use of voice and dialogue delivery too ensue from the fact of their being thoughtful rather than emotion arousing it is here too that kaul is close to dostoevsky the writer excelled in internal speech dialogue with others bakhtin has discussed what he calls the silencing of genres that occurred when literature moved from the realm of the oral to the written this silent speech which is not the same as the modernist stream of consciousness is what we often hear in money calls films the reading voice rather than the speaking voice in real time once we understand this we are in a better position to appreciate the inflections of voice in his films the dialogues too are written in the mixed registers of spoken speech and internal speech he in fact uses a large repertoire of speech registers in satay se utta aadmi for instance there are readings from texts recitations of poems and normal talk interspersed with discussions on the nature of art in duvida there is an interplay of the narrator's voice the reported speech of the bride and bridegroom the internal speech of the bride as well as dialogue between characters <coughs> call uses this method also to preserve the textuality of the written work these theories of the object the interface with subjectivity and the three states of waking dreaming sleeping were brought together from traditions of western modernism and psychoanalysis indian aesthetic traditions from dhanya lok and from classical and folk singing traditions in an almost seamless fashion in mani's writings this was the tradition he invented and dialogued with a tradition that was classical modern and modernist at the same time without any moribund fundamentalizing in cinema the object exists it needs to be internalized this was one of mani's central beliefs the internalization of the object could occur through what he called spatio temporal variants the primary space time variant mythic space time variant and socio historical space time variant they are nothing by themselves unless they are aligned to a specific system of knowledge in formal terms he abhorred convergence linear storytelling preferring the presentation of narratives to representation yet the newness of the new image is not to be found here he did not grow out of it did not grow out of a critique of realism as it did in the west the devices may be those of modernism but the traditions that were informing them were eclectic why do you take things to such a pitch he is said to have asked his teacher ritvik ghatak in the same breath in udayan vajpayee's uncloven space he says that he learned a lot from ghatak's use of melodrama ghatak had achieved non-linearity through melodrama that drew on epical mythical and contemporary narratives of loss and trauma by creating geological layerings within the image call did not use melodrama his cinema punctures the high emotionality of melodrama even before it is arrived at 
However, while he dispenses with the drama, he retains the gut-wrenching emotionality of Milos in a very Ghatakian way, where Ghatak's film, in their majestic, epical unfolding, have very rich, dense and complex music scores, Call's use of music, though equally emotionally saturated, is minimalistic and sparse. When it comes, however, it comes with the force of pure emotion as resonance, as an articulation of thoughts unarticulated in speech. The music by the Dagars in particular, in many of his films, have pioneered a way of using notes, phrases and compositions as that which speaks beyond speech. If Ghatak emerging from the trauma of partition and the splits of the communist and left cultural movements provided in his films the palimpsestic mode of dealing with time, where trauma was sheathed in layers of mythical, allegorical and quotidian time, Cole, while employing these space-time variants, chose another path, that of conjunction and laying out, rather than layering them one over the other. This is one of the reasons it seems to me that he says that shooting belongs to the waking state but editing belongs to the dreaming state. It is also the reason that he called the process of editing joining and the cut the joint. This is most deeply felt in the long documentaries he made, Satya Se Uttar Admi 1980 on Mukti Bodh, Dhrupad 1982, Mati Manas 84 and Siddheshwari 89. In these path-breaking films, the quotidian and the mythic, the historical and the self-reflexive are joined in such a way that they retain their autonomy while contributing to the larger narrative. Nita in Ghatak's Meghe Dakatara was at once Uma Durga Parvati with the connotative layerings that had been built up so that at one point when it reached the pitch, a gesture, a look, a turn of the head was enough to release the mythical or other significances. In Siddheshwari, for instance, on the contrary, the actress presenter is now Agandharva, now Siddheshwari. Siddheshwari, in fact, is structured in a way that is reminiscent of Godar's Veev Savi. The chapters or narrative segments are announced right in the beginning. Later on, they are enacted. The confrontation between the aunt and the singer, for instance, is enacted and then recounted once again towards the end by a now mellow Siddheshwari who has seen this world. This recounting is a device that Kaur uses often in his features and documentaries. What is interesting here is that Kaur, though like Godar, announces the scope of the scene to be enacted beforehand, he does it right at the beginning, for had he done it like Godar as intertitles, his editing joints between segments would have been disturbed. One of the most moving sequences in Siddheshwari is the death of the Guru Siyaji Maharaj, which to my mind compares with the great opening sequence of Davjenko's Earth. The old man in Earth lays himself down, waiting for death, and when it doesn't come, cuts an apple, eats an apple, and then again lies down in the death position and passes on, even as his family and a young child surround him. The passing of an age and a way of life and the ushering in of the new is similarly captured in Sadeshwari with the Sarangi player lying on a cot playing, it seems, till the last breath. Mani's films constantly transgressed canon boundaries. They were not, properly speaking, documentaries or docudramas. They were not ethnographic films or biographies. They were usually classified as poetic documentaries for, lack, for want of a better term. What is also important is that whether he was dealing with an ancient musical gharana or an even more ancient pottery making tradition, he always brought the narrative to the moment of the modern, even if it was the archive as in the last sequence of Siddheshwari or the museum as in Mati Manas. The last virtuoso sequence shot of Dhrupad, which brings us and the music into the city of Bombay from the forts, palaces and Jantar Mantar, linking it to architecture, science, war, patronage, is accompanied by Dhrupad singing, but also by a wonderful separate chorus in which women's voices are singing at a high pitch. In a film in which women have been conspicuously absent, seen only once in a group folk dance, this is a resonant moment. After the elaborate, orderly, decorative and beautifully carved walls and enclaves of the forts and palaces, the city, with its distorted, crowded, disorderly, multi-storied buildings with peeling off paint, hardly seems to be the best spatial environment for the music to grow. Yet there is a feeling of hope and resonance for these films 
uh, in the in the chorus that lifts the spirit. Call drew on myriad sources for these films, including paintings, photographs, written and printed textual sources. Marty Manas, scripted together with Kamil Swaru, is a film that encapsulates his theories of subjectivity in relation to the object and creativity. Kapil Kapoor, in contrasting the creativity tropes of the West and India, makes this discerning distinction between the carpenter and the potter. A whole theory of reality and its representation is implicit in the Greek paradigm of the carpenter. A fourfold ontology is postulated, levels of the real, of existence, of image, of illusion. The artist is a creator or maker of images. He is the master of his material. He measures it, cuts it, segments it, rearranges it to produce a form. It is an analogue of the Greek geometry-centred conception of reality as space, as quantifiable measurement. Now, the paradigm of the artist craftsman in the Indian tradition is the kumbhakara, the potter. Implicit in this choice is of a different paradigm is a different conception of reality and its representation. The potter attaches his hands to the clay rotating on the wheel, shuts his eyes and waits for the immanent form in the clay and the form he saw in his mind to become one. The reality in this paradigm is not quantifiable, not measurable, not segmentable and is not attainable to reorder and is not amenable to reordering or rearrangement. His mind, his body and the clay become a continuity. One may say the form flows from the mind through his hands to merge with and become one with the form in the clay. Soil used to knead into clay migrates from one place to, your, to another in the film. Pot making in different parts of the countries is documented, as are the songs and rituals that accompany it. Artifacts from the Indus Valley civilization and beyond are brought into the narrative, as are other myths and tales from the West and from India. To this are added the potter's own stories about their craft and the hard work that goes into each stage of pot making. All through this documentation and entering into different time frames, other issues are also being woven into the narrative. The gender distinction of labor, patriarchy and caste and class distinctions. The film remains a unique testament not only to the rich history of pottery in this country, but also to the levels of complexity and the doc that the documentary form can be taken to. The other major preoccupation in, in the cinema that Manikol had, apart from what he called the cinematic object, was the problem of time and duration. For Manikol, the problem of time in cinema was a philosophical one. It is this engagement with the concept of duration and memory that Kohl and Tarkovsky are close to each other. It is interesting to see how two filmmakers working in very different contexts at roughly the same time from the 60s onwards, despite all the problems they were driven by of finance, of distribution, of political censorship in the case of Tarkovsky and in the case of Kohl, virulent accusations of formalism, elitism and of wasting the taxpayers' money they nonetheless found the energy to approach this complex problem of temporality in cinema with the kind of seriousness that they did. With Bergson and the scientific discoveries of the 20th century, notably the Einsteinian postulate that time is the fourth dimension of space, time came to be discussed not in the framework of the individual cogito and consciousness, but as existing apart with an ontological status of its own. Time was not merely within us as subjects, but outside. We, as were the trees, stones, animals, planets, as well as the universe, were within it. Time was beyond the human. It was continuous. It was a continuum. What we, as humans, could know was time as tense, <coughs> as past, present, and future, as memory and desire. As Pierre Simon Laplace famously put it, if there were a vast subject and intellect, that could embrace the formula of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the slightest atom, nothing would be uncertain for it and the future, like the past, would be present to its eyes. Maybe it was this vast intellect that the Polish science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem was trying to image when he thought of the brain planet Solaris in 1961, a brain that covered the whole surface of the planet that did not need to move, to produce, to consume, to circulate, to network. Maybe it was this being that could see the past, present and future all at once and when it offered up pure and hybrid clones to the humans who were studying it, they were filled with fear, despair and the desire to commit suicide. 
In the 1972 Solaris, Tarkovsky creates images and sequences that could belong to the intermingled consciousness of the ocean brain and Chris Kelvin. I'm referring here to the mirror image of Kelvin's mother and his house on earth with objects from that house covered in cellophane that forms part of Kelvin's feverish delirium on the space station. And the final sequence, the epilogue of the film, where the house on earth with its father and with his father and dog is offered, in a sense, as a gift to Kelvin from the ocean. This dismantling of the clear-cut sense of past, present, future was taken to the next level by Tarkovsky in her 75 film Mirror. Ignat, the protagonist's young son, has been left alone in his father's house to spend some time there. He wanders from room to room. This house becomes a nation house in which, in one room, he encounters a lookalike of Akmatava who asks him to read out the 19th century thinker Chadaev's letter on Russia and her links to the West and East in the next in the next room, a Spanish exile is trying to teach a young girl a Spanish dance and remembering bullfights. There are scenes from the Spanish Civil War. The father calls up his son to ensure everything is all right and narrates the story of a Leningrad boy from his childhood during the Second World War where who could not understand that about turn meant 180 degrees and not a 360 degree turn in military training. The hot air balloon and the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, two faces of scientific endeavor in the 20th century are also shown, as are the Soviet Union's border problems with China. There is also the invocation of a painting by Peter Bruegel, providing succor to all the sufferings of the century. Such is the vast spectrum of this very large narrative segment. It is the backbone of the film and it dismantles the very paradigm of short scene sequence. These distinctions are dissolved much in the same way that identities are dissolved in this nation house in which every room opens out onto a memory. How can we distinguish between shots, scenes and sequences, their beginnings and ends when we are in the realm of memory and boundaries and territories of personal national historical paths run into each other? So blurred are these lines that we can no longer even say whose memory it is, whether it is a person who calls up the memory or memory interpolating the subject or memory calling up other memories. Maybe this is a repository of national memories in which people reside. Tarkovsky seems to posit that nations also create memory communities where memory is liberated from residing in individual minds but lives organically, sensuously enveloping communities, living a life other than the officially authorized one. These are not flashbacks or flash forwards, these are what Diller's calls recollection images. What Tarkovsky was doing in the Soviet Union was echoed in a different way around the same time in the works of Manikol. In his work, too, the continuum of time is given an existence that has a distinct identity, quite separate from the subjective time being lived by the protagonist. Uski Roti, based on Mohan Rakesh's story, eschews all plot development and conventional narrative devices in order to sketch the life of a woman whose sole reason for existence is to deliver lunch to her truck driver husband as he, when he passes through the bus stop in her village. If she is lucky, he will spend a day in the week with her. If she is lucky, she will arrive on time for her to hand over his lunch. Her life is defined by the weight, the deference of the important things of her everyday life that she would like to convey to him, the rupees 50 that she gets from him for the upkeep of a frugal existence. In Uski Roti, Kohl transforms landscape into still life, the human face into landscape. Dillers states that, between an empty space and landscape and a still life properly so-called, there are many similarities, shared functions and imperceptible transitions. But it is not the same thing. A still life cannot be confused with a landscape. An empty space owes its importance above all to the absence of a possible content, while the still life is defined by the presence and composition of objects which are wrapped up in themselves or become their own container. The surrounding fields in Uski Roti are complete unto themselves. They are there as much in self-reverie as the woman is. Does she see them in any attentive recognition? Even her walk through the field is reverie written, a reverie we are not sure that breaks when she stops to presumably watch passing sheep being driven by a shepherd. Her face has become landscape, 
precisely because the weight induces no anger, sorrow, helplessness, boredom or fatigue. She too is still life, wrapped up in her own reverie, a reverie that may well be paradoxically blank. Only a truant onion that leaps out from a gunny bag on the ground can elicit the faintest of fleeting smiles from her. It is in this weight that the real and the imaginary worlds begin to replace each other. For this lonely woman, past, present, future have no separate existence in the duration of her weight. The waking dream sleep states have all become one towards the end. Has the husband relented? Did he really find the compassion in himself to ask her what was troubling her? Or did he not come at all and did she continue to sit there for eternity? The first three films, Uski Roti, Ashar Ka Ek Din and Duvidha, form a trilogy on women's life defined by the suffering of separation and the weight of waiting. The centrality of the theme of waiting is dealt with not with joy and anticipation, for that would look towards the future, nor with pain and suffering, for that would digress to its effects. Call's attention was pinned to the weight as weight itself, in other words as duration. The pain, the suffering, mutate into quiet fortitude, stoicism, resignation in passing through the sieve of this durator. By the time Call makes Ermak, based on Dostoevsky's Idiot in 1992, the nature of the time image has changed. No longer is it governed by an infusion of time through stillness, separation, weight. Nor has the folktale space been evacuated of time as in Dovidha. Time as a move to the static, as Call had put it in an early interview, or time as distilled stillness or sedimentation had given way to time in deframings. In Ahmak, we have immense mobility of space, time and characters. The polyphonic world of Dostoevsky, with its characters from different social worlds, intersecting with different worldviews, breaking perspectival realism, creating non-converging plot lines with breathless confrontations leading to further divergences was a challenge to call with his own predilection for non-linear narratives. Not for Dostoevsky the establishing of a figure in a landscape, but the restless walks through the cityscape with the dialoguing of and with the social other, even, in the, even if the other is an imagined one or within oneself. In the later part of his work and life, Call was to move towards an even more critical position vis-a-vis -vis perspective and metaphorically state that he did not want the cameraman to look through the lens, for even that was colonization and appropriation of space. He was to adopt a position that was the inverse of Bresson, while Bresson did innumerable retakes to re achieve the state of grace at the very moment that the actors gave up Manikol came to believe that the retake was a misnomer because every take was new and the new random in every take was to be welcomed. As such, the time image no longer contained time sedimented as of yore, but forked endlessly with optical and sound situations, achieving high levels of autonomy. In the segment where Mishkin comes to Ganya's house for the first time as paying guest, he meets his family, his bride-to-be, Nastasia Filipovna and Rogozhin with his strange band of friends. Once again, as in Mirror, it is difficult to categorize this as a sequence. The space of the drawing room has been carnivalized with centripetal and centrifugal healing and destructive forces, entries and exits. Space, through sound and visual images, is constantly getting redefined with circuits that bring the off-screen into the orbit of the in-frame only to move out again. Of all the adaptations of Dostoevsky's Idiot, Mani's Ermak stands out for its fidelity to the polyphonic structure of the literary text. In this film, he comes closest to a-centering a the frame, which captures the clash of worldviews so central to Dostoevsky's vision. One may have disagreements on the actual adaptation of the plot, the transferences and the equivalences opted for, but the film remains a landmark for the way in which the frame is constantly opened out or threatened by the off-screen and the way the frame rarely rests to create a perspectival view that is constantly pulled in different directions. Kurosawa's 1951 adaptation of Idiot, Hakuchi, in comparison, uses standard, more static framings in its, test, in its treatment. It is not space that forks, but time, says Dillers. In both Tarkovsky and Call, we find this forking of time informed and infused with their specific aesthetic visions. 
Tarkovsky in his films is still working with a problematic of home, the home as inhabited by many time frames that forks into the sheets of recollection <coughs> images. Call, on the other hand, is working in most of his major fiction films as well as the poetic documentaries with the idea of homelessness, thematically as well as in terms of narrative style, extending into the very flow of the shots. This homelessness is not one of anarchy or chaos, but of composure. It is only in Nokoki Kamiz, made in 1999, based on Vinod Kumar Shikla's novel, that the protagonist loves to leave home, not because it gets him away, but because it allows him to keep returning to base. Mani's works were not allegorical, national or otherwise. What held the segments together were the narrators and protagonists who took on many roles and wandered and presented themselves through these different space-time variants. I use the term wander deliberately. In this, he is close to the work of another great Soviet filmmaker whose work he admired, Sergei Parajanov, particularly his film, Ashik Kevib. Tarkovsky created images saturated and soaked in time. For Kohl, on the contrary, like Parajanov, time was a continuum which his protagonist wandered through at will. In Ghatak too, there is a desire for dispersal that floats up once in a while. The sequence of the theatre group in Komal Gandhar going off to spend some time on the river Padma comes to mind. But there is a gathering up of the counter heart, there is a gathering up of counter heartrending energy slicing through the pastoral idol in the Duhai Ali ending of the sequence. In call, there is never any gathering up. The narrative moves like a musical exposition. The phrase begins at one place and ends elsewhere. To conclude then, where does the newness of the new image reside in Mani Call's work? It lies in the creation of a theoretical edifice and the dialogue with traditions that brought non-mainstream Western and Indian theories of subjectivity, object and the image together. It lies in the adaptation of modernist elements welded to a classicity, in transgressing boundaries and canons set for the narratives of documentaries and feature films in being part of a new vision of time and its imaging in cinema, in creating a cinema of what I would call dispassionate compassion, in bringing the absent into focus as much as the present and focusing on resonance, and finally, in using music as ecstasy and pathos. One must ask, in the end, is there any future for such a cinema? I would say an emphatic yes. In a world where the cinemas of cruelty, the cinemas of violence, the cinemas of bigger and bigger spectacles are proliferating everywhere. A cinema of intellection that allows a more peaceful unfolding of time can surely be accorded a small corner somewhere to exist in. The critical evaluation of this legacy is also important for the emphasis in the institutionalized discipline of film studies is on cultural studies with its predisposition for popular culture. The practice of filmmakers such as Kohl, who are aligned to philosophy, tend to receive scant attention and engagement. I was never part of Mani Kohl's inner circle, a circle that we all know was very large given his magnetic and charismatic personality. I was a distant critical observer of his works. He once spent a few days at our house. I had on an earlier occasion heard him recount how his ustad, used to make him sing and practice a single note for days on end, how bored he used to get and how it was only much later that he understood the significance of this. On this day, he was sitting alone on the mattress in my house and in the quiet, he suddenly started singing only one note, Sa. I stopped doing whatever I was in the next room and I listened. I had never heard a Sa of such clarity and purity, a standalone note so translucent that it actually demonstrated its difference from all other notes. In this one moment, the host-guest relationship changed to an unintended one of teacher-student, where in a flash I understood all his theories of uplabd and anuplabd, presence and absence, meditation and attention. It is to the memory of that moment and that note that I humbly dedicate this lecture. Thank you very much.
I think you will agree this has been a brilliant, in fact the word brilliant is somewhat inadequate, but my English is poor, so I couldn't think of another one. The brilliant exposition of the Manika moment in cinema. And uh, <coughs> I was a little um, skeptical that the lecture may turn out to be uh, something to do with money goal in a different way. But it turned out to be a very brilliant exposition. And thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I don't think such lectures require question and answer. Uh, would you care for if some people want to say something? Yes, if there is someone. Uh, the movement of how did you say it? Reflect? No, what did you say? Intellection. Intellection may not be exactly after the lecture. So one must imbibe it and then think of it later. So you are not obliged to ask the question, but should you want to, you're free to. Could we have a text of the lecture? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Could we have a text of the lecture? Yeah, yeah, you will have that. We will publish it. Uh, we bring out a journal called Arup, which is uh, a journal in English, uh, not openly, but somewhat insidiously uh, devoted to abstraction and uh, in, in all kinds of uh, <coughs> arts, including literature, and poetry, and music, and cinema, and architecture, and visual arts. So we'll publish it there, as we publish the other lectures. and. Uh, I keep the, yeah. you know, the Reza Foundation is a foundation exclusively funded by the great Indian painter, Sayyid Haider Raza, who after having lived for 60 years in Paris, has now come back home. Normally he would have been here, but he has not been keeping well. He has been in and out of hospital. But this evening when I left him, he was painting. And I thought this is not a moment when he should be disturbed and reminded that you have a duty to go to the lecture. Um, as I said, we have instituted seven lectures. Uh, we have had with this three so far. Uh, Kumar Gandhar Memorial Lecture delivered by T.M. Krishna. By uh, uh, Rashmi Dorai Swami, this other one. And Pratap Bhanu Mehta delivered the Daya Krishna Memorial Lecture. So we have the next Agge Memorial Lecture on 3rd November to be delivered by Hiren Gohai from Guwahati, who is both an important Assamese critic, a radical activist and a retired professor of English. And incidentally, he was my classmate. And for a long number of years, he held a record of attaining some 74 or 75% of marks in English literature, which is completely unheard of. So he is going to talk about translation. And we have the Habib Tanvir Memorial Lecture on 28th November be delivered by Professor Navjyoti Singh from Hyderabad. And on the 30th of October, we have Aesthetics of Excess and Transgression to be, this is a panel discussion, Art Matters is a series of almost monthly panel discussions that we hold in the other part in the main auditorium, I mean in the main uh, IIC, in the multi-purpose hall. Uh, and this time it will be Aesthetics of Excess and Transgression. Kamleshi, who is here, a poet, S. Kalidas, a music critic, Purushottam Agrawal, a Kabir scholar, and Navje, Navte Johar, a Bharatnatyam dancer. So they will be talking about this. And the next one is going to be Reflections on Failure. I thought in a world which is so obsessed with success, 
we must ponder and think of failure and how important sometimes failure is and how trivial sometimes success is. But we have just to sort of have requested several people. Thank you once again, Rashmiji. You came late, but you made up for a really all that with a brilliant lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you. Space. Uh, some copies are available. Should you like to buy them, you can.